Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on natural flood management, uh, a case study in the headwaters of the Warwickshire Avon using XP Swim. My name is Peter Coombs, and I'm delighted to welcome our guest speaker today, and that's Tom Lavers. Tom's a PhD student and NFM consultant, and Tom's been working on this project for the past year or so. It's interesting to note that since the extensive flooding in Cumbria and the subsequent response of governmental reports, that natural flood management has surged in interest across flood and coastal erosion risk management stakeholders. Now, this particular project is aimed to create a truly holistic approach where we're working with partners and data to inform where and how we can work with natural processes. And this is in order to manage flooding in the headwaters of the Warwickshire Avon. Now, during the, during the webinar, Tom from Coventry University will present um, the PhD research carried out to date and how they made NFM a grounded approach, um, how Tom in particular has worked with local communities and engaged with all the stakeholders, how we've increased understanding of the catchment systems, both hydrologically as well as hydraulically, and looking at the intended outputs with the XP Swim software that Tom's utilizing for the scheme. And a quick mention on that, the, it's a little bit too early and sensitive to share the actual model, so this is very much a background and case study that Tom will now cover for us. Uh, I'll follow on after Tom and go through the methodologies we're in implementing in the model, uh, and then we can take questions by the way as we're going through. So for those that haven't engaged in the webinars before, you'll have a little pop-up window. Um, you can um, send in a message. Uh, we have Lou Miller here as well. Thank you for looking at the messages for us, Ludi. And we'll endeavor to take questions and answer those at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Tom. Great. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, everyone watching, who spared their lunch break for this particular webinar. Now, before we start, I'd like to make a few further acknowledgements to the project partners, aside from the Centre for Agroecology, Water and Resilience, and XP. This project has been in partnership with FCRM stakeholders, funded by Warwickshire County Council, as part of the English 7 and Y RFCC, who have been real drivers for this sort of catchment-based ethos and whom are also funding the Shrouds Rural Sudge Project and the good work Chris is doing at the District Council over there. Now, for the agenda today, this webinar will discuss some of the methods, results and experiences as part of the first year of my PhD. It will be split into three dominant subsections. Firstly, I'll give you some sort of background project context, defining natural flood management in regards to recent policy and practice advocations over the few you know, months and even days then discussing the specifics of my study area in regards to the issues NFM must address across the catchment, which you can see on the right hand side outlined in red, located in the headwaters of the Warwickshire Avon Rural Operational Catchment at the top of the Seven River Basin District, with the majority of the land use being intensely agricultural. I'll then touch upon how this research has tried to support meaningful engagement, which in my experience has commonly come under criticism from past approaches and local communities that have felt local knowledge and concerns have not been considered when flood risk planning. Then I'll discuss the method applied to date and lessons from scoping and implementing natural flood management. Now this will include, as Peter said, the preliminary results from the first year of this particular PhD, successes in the farming community at understanding the particular ethos of, of NFM and agricultural land drainage alteration for flood alleviation purposes, as well as some of the negatives associated with funding an NFM catchment based approach considering the current silos of funding and how the gaps in research can be filled with the overall aim of this PhD, which is to really value a meso catchment scale NFM scheme and the importance of using appropriate modeling software. Now I'll discuss how the research aims to address some of these funding issues using the study area and the XP Swim software to understand catchment systems hydraulically and hydrologically, and how we can go about appraising and targeting meso scale NFM for different rainfall scenarios. Now, some considerable headway has been made with the array of projects since the multi-objective pilot investigations back in the year 2000, but I hope you can see the need for more investment in time and understanding of this particular field. It's also worth noting the modelling is, as Peter said, in infancy and it's insensitive. However, I hope to take you through a step-by-step -step methodological guide and look forward to receiving any questions and comments. And I also hope that this webinar can act as a multidisciplinary guide to all backgrounds, not just modelers, interested in working with natural processes on a catchment-based approach. 
Now, I've taken a slight Scottish leaning with my interpretation of natural flood management, and the NFM constitutes techniques that aim to work with natural processes to manage the sources and pathways of floodwaters. These techniques include the restoration, enhancement, and alteration of natural features and characteristics, examples of which include in-channel mechanisms to attenuate flow, such as large woody debris dams. Uh, this is an example from the, the Stroud project. Alteration of the drainage pathways with other damming materials, such as this stone used in the Honeydale Farm project. There are also floodplain features, such as buns, acting as sediment traps for intercepting pluvial flow. And this image was, is also taken from the Stroud project. Now, NFM does exclude traditional flood defence engineering, that works against or disrupts these natural processes. Now, by traditional flood defence engineering, I'm referring to what has historically been the means of managing flood flows, conveying them in hard engineered structures away from people and properties downstream at higher discharge rates. An example of this is ironically the view from my office. Um, no, I don't sit in a, in, the, in a culvert, but I am based in Coventry and the heavily modified River Sherborne is culverted under the majority of the city centre with some exposed points for trolley tipping. Now, as I'm sure you're aware, the concerns with this historical method is the limits in capacity. And those who have worked in such retrofitting will know it can often be extremely costly enlarging traditional drainage capacities, especially with the influence of reviewed climate change allowances. Now, when I started this particular research, I commonly came across many other researchers that said NFM is reinventing the wheel and that these sorts of approaches have existed for years, you know, including rural suds, permaculture, farmer retention, etc. Now, I would agree that the components within NFM are techniques that have been employed for years, but as an ethos, it's not just reinventing the wheel, but enlarging it. And that's where the real challenge comes, understanding how these measures interact holistically when upscaled, which brings me to my next point, the significance of scale. Now, my fluvial catchment is 187 kilometres squared, with a variety of different sources and pathways of floodwaters, which impact different receptors at different times. Previous computational methods and data sources have found this a challenging task, with resolution and reliability being a key issue. But advances over the last 40 years or so have allowed us to obtain a better understanding of catchment systems. However, the derivation of relationships between the rainfall over a catchment area and the resulting fluvial flow is a fundamental problem for hydrologists at this sort of scale that, that many of you watching will be aware of. Now on the meso scale, XP Swim's ability to illustrate spasmodic rainfall and differing surfaces influences, such as your soil types, geology, land cover, and significantly the spatially heterogeneous antecedent pedological conditions that affect infiltration rates and overland flow type is critical. Now, as some of you may recognize on the left, this is an image view of different NFM features in different locations across a catchment from the SEPA Natural Flood Management Handbook. Now, as you can see from the matrix on the right hand side, adapted from Thorn et al in 2007, is that these measures interact at different scales and locations. This matrix indicates the different suggestions I've mapped across the catchment that I'll go into more detail later. But as you can see, measures at the source such as wider catchment afforestation and runoff attenuation features, as coined by the, the great work in Belford, are at a spatially diffuse scale. As we work our way down the catchment to points of floodplain reconnection, you know, you're looking at bank lowering here and washlands, it becomes clear that conventional modeling techniques of the 1D environment are more reliable in determining the effectiveness of these schemes at retaining flow. This is likely due to the spatially concentrated nature of the schemes themselves, which can provide sort of meter cube storage values per area of retention. However, what research has found to date is that these downstream measures need to interact with the upstream in order to attenuate flows more successfully. We're looking at an aggregation effect. Of course, these are dependent on your individual catchment context you're working with, and more importantly, the areas of risk you're trying to alleviate. Because really what we're trying to do is integrate flood risk management through a more rounded means. Apologies for this slight woolly-headed academic bit, but we're trying to understand the balance between people and processes. How do the people, such as farmers, impact the catchment's flood propagation, as well as how the flooding impacts the properties, businesses, and farming communities themselves? Now, in terms of practicalities, the application of these schemes and what it means on the ground is key. In principle, past drainage techniques across agricultural catchments, as is my patch, during wartime intensification have been based on great levels of under drainage, as shown on the left, commonly with stock grazing, such as sheep, and leading to improved grasslands of clays. Now, we need to consider how we can review pipe-based schemes, such as your mole ploughing, to areas of semi-permeable retention, like the ponding area on the right. 
Now, both these images were taken in different parts of the catchment. Now, whilst I won't mention the landowners by name, it is clear that local champions can make a real difference in supporting best practice when it comes to altering farm drainage. And as I said previously, what I'm really trying to do is protect properties and businesses. Now, this particular event internally flooded the, this property 30 minutes later. It is located at the downstream extent of the study site with approximately six hours of warning and required the carpet to be quickly lifted and belongings moved upstairs. Once ingress occurred, it took the owner weeks of drying and clearing before being able to make the downstairs of the home livable again. Of course, investment decisions and agendas are driven by policy and practice, which over the past months and even days have been very much pushing NFM and catchment based approaches. Please see some reference key documents. Now, most recently, the EFRA committee report highlighted the importance of developing these catchment based plans to manage flooding at the large scale, technically being in excess of 100 kilometers squared. Now, in defense of those agencies involved in managing flooding, I think it's worth noting that this sort of approach has been the pipeline for quite some time, as we've been going with the flow, as it were. And this is in reference to the diagram at the bottom of the page and to many of you watching who will have either completed or are familiar with lots of similar case studies occurring nationally that have been ongoing for some time, trying to better understand the science behind the sort of largely theoretical field. Now it is clear end of pipe and last line of defense approaches are unsustainable as shown in the winter 15, 16 events. Since then, considerable investment from DEFRA and EA, both financial resources and expertise, such as the Working with Natural Processes Group publications, with the EA and supporting consultants such as JBA and others have supported this ongoing knowledge sharing exercise that I hope today can be for you all too. Now back to my study site, as you can see from the right, the headwater extent is made of three dominant feeds that flow south to north, you have the Kneebrook, Stour and Nethercote Brook. Collectively, it's 187 kilometers square to the downstream node, the Shipston on Stour River gauge. In terms of issues, there is a high flood frequency that leads to internal flooding of properties and businesses indicated by these red blobs, Exception being the July 2007 event that flooded in excess of 180 properties across the catchment. And most recently, the March 2016 event that flooded four. And what we have are muddy flows, flashy hydrographs and high peak over thresholds recorded from the only National River Flow archive gauge, leaving little warning time and a bit of an indication of some synchronized flows. Now, in regards to the risks due to the spatial nature of the properties, None have been able to qualify for granting aid due to the level of cost associated with localised engineered schemes. Furthermore, pre-2012 and the involvement of the DEFRA Pathfinder project spearheaded by the National Flood Forum, many communities believed desilting bridge arches and dredging rivers was the only means of addressing peak flows. Since then, expert advice has highlighted the short-term issues with desilting river profiles downstream if continued silt contributes upstream. Now, on the topic of silts, the catchment is failing WFD status due to sediment attached phosphate issues impacting macrophytes and phytopenthos populations. This is recognised to be due to the dominant diffuse source from agricultural land use, with many Natural England targets for stewardship in the agricultural environment. Previously, entry level stewardship, high level stewardship that's now transferring to countryside stewardship that have failed to be met, many of which indicate areas for alteration for flood alleviation purposes and planting for water quality improvement. Now, hopefully you can see that any scheme has to be holistic in its approach that can work for all stakeholders across the catchment. Now, for the first task of my PhD, um, it was important to characterise the catchment area and understand where it might be possible to locate features that can slow, store and filter flow. This slide will take you through this process step by step to inform how data and qualitative input can inform a bit of a rounded understanding of the catchment. Now, firstly, it was important to understand the scale of contributions. Therefore, discretization of the three dominant tributaries into the 36 local scale subcatchments allowed for a more manageable task. This is also a time saving exercise when relaying mapped outputs to the modeling stage when scenario assessing the timing of hydrographs from subcatchments as available to do in XP Swim. It was then important to use GIS hydrology tools to do this, including watershed delineation in the ArcMap 10.4 software, building a reliable DTM from verifying elevation and LIDAR coverage, identifying key runoff pathways in conjunction with updated flood maps for surface water and fluvial flood extents where evulsion occurs. The LIDAR was made freely available from the Environment Agency Geostore site, an existing model updated flood maps for surface water and fluvial flood extents available from the LLFA and EA. This was supported by hydrology of soil type data, known as HOST, 
geology and land cover map 2007 data to indicate infiltration rates, surface roughness patterns that all influence the existing flow pathways and types of NFM features that could be located. Furthermore, identifying locations of previous agricultural practice from historical pre-wartime intensification maps, such as previous areas of ponding, um, old land registry that indicates previous hedgerow boundaries. This all gives a temporal reference to Restore 2, as well as an indication of possible measures in precise locations. From there, I was able to locate possible areas that could be suitable for NFM, such as points of ponding in the floodplain, as well as high Hortonian pluvial runoff pathways. Then, by overlaying existing schemes such as EA medium term plans and natural English stewardships available from DEFRA Magic Map in conjunction with Pharma Consultation, I was able to understand what is planned for the catchment and what is currently being done to manage drainage over farmland and wider environmental betterment schemes as part of the sort of agri environment agenda that can directly link with NFM. It was then vital for me to review many of the existing studies that have been conducted to understand best practice and specifically those in donor catchments what sorts of measures have been employed, where and how. This supported the second and third steps by putting precise measures into particular locations across the catchment. These locations were reviewed, verified by extensive field walking, undertaking reconnaissance surveys and participatory mapping with the landowners and farmers. Now, the latter was initially undertaken due to the land being privately owned and requiring access permission. However, it became quickly apparent these stakeholders could provide local knowledge of their farm holding in regards to hydrological characteristics and influences of flood generation and propagation. Therefore, field walking photography and base maps from the previous steps allowed the farming community to comment on the locations of possible schemes, as well as commenting on what schemes could be more successful and mutually beneficial. Now, it's worth noting a supportive local flood action group were essential in acting as gatekeepers for this particular task. In my experience, external consultants and researchers have a different dynamic than local residents. Now, this informed a map of opportunities, 308 in total, located across this catchment. And as said previously, this current research stage is broadly conceptual. But as lessons from Scotland has found, we must not underestimate local knowledge. Now, I'll quickly take you through an example NFM opportunity in the CAM subcatchment. This is in the headwaters of the Kneebrook. On the left hand side, you can see the base map of opportunities. This is a useful technique when discussing landowner input and then commonly having some sort of particular field names that they then can relay to a master map backdrop. The measures identified in this ephemeral stream, as shown by the picture taken on the right, include clay buns to act as runoff attenuation features. Now, the original locating of measures indicated this area as a possible space for wider catchment afforestation. However, the landowner was concerned how this would impact his high-level stewardship agreement with Natural England. Therefore, using a pond calculating tool and an indication of water moving through an orifice outlet bund, um, it had the ability, each of these three bunds, to attenuate 35 metres cubed of water at maximum capacity. Now, looking at a cross-section of the land, the area is underlain by a, a local substrate called Cotswold Brash, outlined by, as I say, by this cross-section. Now, the designing of these schemes for modelling, it was important that buns were able to allow for infiltration to this oolitic limestone, slowing the fast overland flows of the clay loam. Of course, in later modelling, it would be important to consider the antecedent conditions in winter events and the existing height of the water table to ensure we're not trying to infiltrate to an area already saturated, encouraging further flows. On another practical note, if you can squint a little bit, intersecting buns B and C are recognised to provide vehicle and sheep access in spate conditions, which was a, a very attractive proposition for the landowner in terms of evacuation routes that Peter will discuss later. Um, again, on a more practical basis, um, it's important to recognise these sorts of working with natural processes features are aptly named so because they do mimic what is already happening in our catchments. This particular brook as a few existing large wooded debris dams form naturally but not removed by the farmer. This can be included in the base modelling of XB Swim as structures that would impede and alter flow. However, on the ground, ensure that you examine the features in terms of how does it currently respond to heavy rainfall? Is there a considerable change in afflux levels? Is there a local wood source that's of a suitable age? For example, this willow, can it be pleached to the bank to retain structural integrity? If you're with the farmer, ask if it impacts the business in terms of encouraging earlier avulsion onto particularly productive crop, 
It would be fair to assume it doesn't if it's in situ and looks well established, but nonetheless an important question. It's also important to consider what maintenance would be required, if any. Now hydrologically, could this function be altered with changes to the structure? Are there any gullies, riffles emerging where you want them to and not undercutting or eroding the bank? And as I said previously, if you're with the farmer, ask if this sort of scheme could be mimicked elsewhere. Now back to the meso scale, based on these opportunities of where to locate different features, 308 NFM opportunities have hypothetically the ability to attenuate 432,530 meters cubed at maximum capacity when acting in peak events. Now this is using a ponding assessment of conventional attenuation features and calculations of storage based on increased roughness and, and slope in terms of ruffling features such as forested water and retention areas, as well as ensuring all landowners and farmers consent to the works and designs. This is of course a completely hopeful figure without considering model timing of, of peaks across um, isochrones of the catchment and the impact of the storm flow in the hydro graph from different events. Because what we don't want to start doing is blocking all flow and creating a dam burst effect in which water is synchronized in the hydrograph. We want to encourage slower through flow and continued base overland flow. Furthermore, this volume calculated is not water removed from the hydrograph, but the volume that would propagate through the system at a slower rate, with the aim of increasing basin lag time, attenuating the rising limb and a broader crested recession limb. Now what the second equation indicates is that Based on the currently consented and finalised landowner schemes that are seen to go ahead, um, these 31 features can attenuate cumulatively 66,645 metres cubed, each individually coming under the Reservoirs Act, um, but obviously collectively having that attenuation capacity. This is 15.4% of the total design volume potential, indicating that this is a long game and requires supportive communities and farmers to sort of drive this approach when consultants and agencies and other contacts have gone. These calculations require validating through more detailed modelling of peak storm hydrographs from contributing catchments and the overall required volumes to attenuate that can raise a particular standard of protection. Now, what I'd like to do now is take you through some successes and, and limitations of the research thus far, um, but if you don't mind, I'll start with some successes. Now, seven estates and landowners have approved NFM works and looking to implement as soon as possible. One landowner has implemented six measures, which I will show you later, and there has been one reviewed countryside stewardship agreement. As mentioned previously, there is a very supportive local flood action group that helps mobilise the community around taking ownership and also increasing their understanding of the flooding problems. And as I said previously, they also act as gatekeepers and an in for the farming community, as opposed to an external researcher like myself. Now, the majority of the catchments farming community have been contacted, of which 75% are very supportive. I would also say the remaining 25% of those contacted are not unsupportive, but need more convincing of the merits of integrated NFM across the catchment through more effective communication of modelled results, as well as further financial incentives. Now, in terms of limitations, as I'm sure you're aware of this research to date, there is a lack of quantitative evidence around NFM at such a scale. There needs to be a greater understanding of the role of synchronization, flood propagation, and backwater across the catchment of the measures proposed, because as you notice, there were properties also located upstream. Even though these features have been located with buffers of settlements, a greater understanding of especially these in-channel mechanisms is needed around the enhanced risk that could be proposed upstream. That's why initial pilot schemes that have been implemented have been carefully chosen at, flood, at sort of floodplain headwaters extent. Another limitation I found is complexities in funding at a sort of catchment-based approach NFM scheme. Now, there seems to be issues with frameworks that make it difficult for local approaches to get off the ground. Um, principally, um, countryside stewardship um, has been very complex for farmers, um, and also the competitive nature makes it a slight gamble for them because they're having to invest time in, a, in an application that they might not receive any funding for, as well as flood defence grants and age, which fairly requires a decisive present value cost compared to present value benefits considered. However, the scheme is iterative and highly dependent on buy-in and um, obviously on a very large scale, um, this can prove particularly challenging. Uh, now I'll just quickly take you through the importance of meso scale catchment modeling using the SWIM software, the XP SWIM software. Now understanding catchment systems is influenced by two fundamental characteristics. Firstly, identifying the storm flow as represented in the hydrograph. This is obviously the total volume of water present in the system that would otherwise not exist if the event had not happened. 
This is also based on the second fundamental, runoff generation treated non-linearly, with time varying across the hydrograph. Now the relationship between rainfall input and that lost or gained in the system is also key. So looking at you know evaporation losses, etc. Now these fundamentals of the XP swim model aim to inform three approaches that then give this economic appraisal that I'm going for. Firstly, it's important to target the most contributing subcatchments, identifying the timing of peaks when delineated. And this is sort of similarly done by the flood impact model at Newcastle University. Now this allows for the schemes designed and mapped to be better understood in terms of desynchronizing capabilities, as well as understanding the 2D influences that impact runoff generation, as similarly identified in the overflow model used by Durham University. Now XP Swim actually allows for a combination of both these considerations. Then it's important to inform scenario planning, considering the ability of NFM features to attenuate downstream flood flows, understanding the base scenario and the resultant reduction in volumes downstream to different rainfall events. Now I've considered you know, your bank full QMED scenarios, 5, 10, 20, 75, 100, and where available, the climate change allowances for 100 plus climate change. This can be input from FEH storm data with XP swims of built-in function with a recognition of a degree of uncertainty. Then it's important to value the scheme you know, in terms of the reduction, if any, in average annual damages to properties and, and businesses, and the ability of the scheme to transition from current risk based you know, in terms of volumes and depths. Therefore, does NFM transition those exposed properties in Shipston from significant risk to moderate, relating baseline risk scenario to NFM scenarios? Thus, what value is there in implementing an NFM scheme on such a scale? Now, Based on the support from the network of landowners and farmers, XP Swim's GIS friendly outputs allows for a process of informal calibration. This can also indicate duration and time of inundation, which is critical for farm practices, in that duration of flooding may help assess crop damage due to low tolerance for extended periods of flooding. Therefore, using local knowledge to comment on model extents and depths, and if it matches their experiences and ideally images of the particular events. This exercise will also allow the model to provide present value benefits of the scheme in accordance with the multicolored handbook that you can see associated with present value costs that can be determined from things like contractor quotes and other studies, um, and obviously well as the, the cost to the landowner you know, with crop or corners of land being inundated. Now, in most emerging studies, the NFM features are modeled using different approaches and softwares depending on the function of each feature. Now, commonly these are split into the corresponding domain, so those features designed to intercept 2D surface flow, so if I take hedgerows, for example, are modeled in broad catchment assessment techniques. So JB have a J flow plus, for example. Um, those features that aim to interact the in-channel and floodplain flows in the 1D environment, so we're looking at ditch management, LWDs, are assessed using commonly ICES sort of two flow models. Now by the XP swim software linking two domains dynamically, this allows water to go between both environments and specifically give a greater representation of the 2D environment and the heterogeneous influences that can be altered based on the map surveys, including things like existing hetero locations. Now, the modeling framework employed in this study consists of a combination of, as I say, 1D for this storage modeling and 2D for you know, your routing and your flood inundation modeling. These outputs are likely to alter the designs of the measures that I've previously discussed to ensure we're not augmenting the hydrograph in a way that prevents coinciding of peaks and maximizes the measures abilities across the catchment to desynchronize these flood flows. Now, I'm quickly going to touch upon um, wider remunerations across ecosystem services. Um, while this isn't explicitly part of the PhD, I think it's important to consider, especially for from those backgrounds that aren't associated with modeling. Now, as commonly addressed in academic spheres, NFM is recognised to provide wider benefits across these ecosystem services. Most of these, if you're looking at, you know, kilometres of improvement for water framework directive targets and habitat creation, give an economic benefit to the scheme associated with partnership funding calculators and stewardship payments. It's important to consult Natural England regarding these agri-environment schemes and possible payments as part of the countryside stewardship tiered schemes and or associated capital grants. These provide a further indication of the present value benefits of the scheme economically. Now, this slide will take you through the construction of the baseline model prior to the NFM scenario that will not be discussed in this webinar due to some sensitivity issues as well as the infancy. But firstly, it was important to commence with the 1D model build and importing, delineating sort of subcatchments from this opportunity mapping phase and ensuring discretization of the whole catchment. 
them based on the associated Strada order and the contributed catchment, determining cross sections, as you can see on the right, and bank crest levels. This includes in channel structures that could impede flow and auto flow, including weirs, existing debris dams, and assigning channel roughness values based on the type of water course. Then it's important to then input this FEH rainfall data that's available to do so. Uh, this data is a, a 1999 source and then generate return interval storms. Of course, there is a real issue with associ you know, associated validity of this sort of data, that these are not directly calibrated to return periods, therefore need to be sensitively analyzed in terms of volume errors relating to the one stage discharge monitoring station that I have at this catchment. Then it's important to generate initial model conditions, including water depth and anacidic conditions. Then incorporating the 2D domain, outlining the, the 1D and 2D domains on a 2D grid extent function, as you can see. Then assigning Manning's end value for surface roughness and um, using land cover map 2007 coverage, as you can see here. Then connecting 1D and 2D domains, enforcing bank crest levels with floodplain levels. Now, this is an interesting consideration when assessing features that force evulsion at earlier rates, increasing volumes and levels on the bank of the river network, such as enhanced debris dams, not just your conventional smaller ones, or points of enlarged online and offline ponding. Inclusion of downstream boundary conditions is then followed, allowing water to spill from the floodplain. And then it's important to try and alter the sort of floodplain DTM and roughness values based on pre-existing features, such as your outbuildings and, and hedgerows. Now, as part of this modelling, I think it's important to recognise the catchment is mostly engaged with no validating monitoring equipment, with the exception of the downstream no gauge that is past the confluence of the headwaters. Therefore, a great deal of uncertainty must be recognised and calculated with the modelling, including storm events themselves from this FEH data. A lot of past research on larger catchments have highlighted the importance of, as I say, desynchronizing flood flows. Therefore, timings must be carefully considered when attenuating that sort of hypothetical 432, 530 meters cubed of, of EM through the system. This utilizes the unit hydrograph as a routing component of the catchment model and XP swim software based on how long each subcatchment will take to reach the outlet at ships engage and how the hydrograph is fundamentally augmented. Also, Ultimately, this research aims to indicate a transaction of risk bandings for properties and businesses. Therefore, understanding current level of risk is key in the initial assessment of this particular base modeling. Now, I'll quickly go through a summary here, but um, the, before I pass you on to Peter, but the project has identified great opportunities to work with natural processes across the catchment scale. Partnership and interest in the evidence has been key to the success to date. There are practical and numerical issues and questions that need to be addressed with NFM because there is a lack of quantitative evidence around natural flood management at this sort of scale. However, there is lots of good literature coming out to support agencies and, and interested groups into investigating NFM and working with natural processes through a catchment based approach. Examples included here. However, I would like to finish off referring to the 27th recommendation in the pit review and that we need a suite of measures to manage flooding. By no means am I suggesting NFM is a silver bullet, but I hope it can be incorporated as a long-term program that adapts the services of our catchments. Now, the image shows measures that have just been implemented, um, excitingly, uh, in the Kneebrook. You have two intercepting buns that are designed to attenuate pluvial flow, entering the brook in, in peak events, with flow going from right to left and the receiving water course being about 220 metres down. The scheme also includes stone debris to act as in-channel dams to slow a, a particular pond outlet using local Cotswold stone. Now, the use of locally sourced materials keeps costs down whilst trying to perform the same hydraulic function as would large wood debris dams. Now, this scheme also includes the ditch management of neighbouring farmers who have agreed to incorporate you know, their ditches with the bun scheme, attenuating basically two farms for the price of one. Now, this view indicates the cross section of the bund, and hopefully you can make it out there. And it's been footed into the substrate at 1.5 metres high with a 9 inch orifice. Now, to counter the Venturi effects, um, the farmer and I are likely to implement a, a right angled inlet to slow sort of through flow and encourage further attenuation in these peak events while still allowing base flow to continue. Now, as you can see from the bund, the topsoil was removed carefully by the farmer and then reseeded to ensure grass could sort of seed and then hold the band and prevent erosion. Now this image indicates the redirecting ditch behind the first attenuating band. 
Now, it's also worth noting the raised water table and bum mechanisms aim to increase saturation and habitat improvement for um, common skype, they actually frequent the area often. And it's a tar and they're a targeted wading farmland bird for the Warwickshire Raven as a whole. Now, these measures also drop out silts and binding pollutants, mainly pea, from the pluvial flow before it enters the watercourse along this steep conduit of farmland. This farmer is by no means currently farming in a way that encourages diffuse pollution, but he recognised the opportunity in retrofitting his current holding with a scheme that can attenuate even more flow. Now what I'll do is just pass you over to Peter to finish off the presentation. Thank you, Tom. That was really interesting and engaging, and I hope that's opened up some possibilities for the audience at large here to see what we were actually achieving already and uh, very much its infancy but a great start and i very much look forward to keeping everyone up to date with tom and progressing the case study over time so looking at the modeling aspects and what we're doing and where we're going with the modeling i just want to run through the use of um, the xp swim program our modeling software which is being used on this particular scheme what we've been doing historically for the last sort of 30, 40 years with XP Swim is modeling a range of things, whether that be watercourse, drainage systems in the urban environment, in the rural environment, or mixed. And often we get asked the question, what should I do? What's the best method to go forward? Should I use 1D? Should I use 2D? And what we're looking at on this catchment scale is to incorporate the use of both to get the best of both worlds, basically. On the left-hand side here, um, you can see all the various inputs that Tom's kind of mentioned, um, GIS inputs, bringing in terrain models to create surfaces and topography, set up the base scenario. So we have a range of inputs coming into the program, uh, and we run with computational engines. For the 1D hydraulics we're using, as I mentioned earlier, the EPA swim engine. And then when you have surface flooding and we go to the 2D domain, we're using the two-flow engine. Um, so it's a combination of both. And this is where the program comes into its own because it provides this user-friendly interface to enable you to grab whatever information you have from sites. Um, you can also incorporate any missing information, go out, survey, talk to the locals, etc., and uh, enhance that model to get a good base scenario. And very importantly, on the right-hand side, we then need to express the results and look at the various options that we're considering and provide those outputs in a meaningful way that we can share with all the various stakeholders. So to start off with, we bring in a digital terrain model, and this could be the LIDAR data that Tom mentioned that uh, has been provided by the Environment Agency. Upon that terrain model, we can then import the GIS data. So looking at various land usages, um, crop usages, etc., cetera, uh, maybe highways, and provide the various roughnesses upon the surface by creating uh, those from the GIS polygons that are imported. We then start looking at the more detailed aspects that would influence the model more greatly, such as the major water courses. And here we could, well, if you have a Hetcrest model, for example, we could import a Hetcrest model or an ISIS model. If you even had a drainage system, you can import the micro drainage system if you're looking at an impact of a development upon a water course, for example. Um, in the absence of any information, worst case scenario, we could cut cross sections um, from the LIDAR data. This may be not the most accurate, but we could cut cross sections midway along uh, the links. So we'd set the water course up as a range of links and intermediate nodes. So when the cross section of the water course changes, then cut a cross section at the midpoint along the link and then have a series of these shown on the right hand side here. So we have reusable data or if you go out and carry out a survey we can import that survey data and provide a very accurate cross-section as measured now if you were working just in 1d there are a range of advantages but also a range of disadvantages of just working in 1d um, historically this has been probably the more common format that people have been used to working with we've, we've got a lot of good um, quality engineers out there who can very quickly um, set up these models there's not a lot of computational effort required, but you do require a lot of engineering judgment to set these things up properly. Um, so there are advantages and disadvantages. I'm looking at the time, so you can quite happily um, read through this in the recording that I'm making of this particular presentation, or, or just email us and we can send you the presentation uh, directly to you as well. You could work purely in 2D as the other option, 
The issue arises here on scale. So Tom's got a very large area. So we would set up some very large grid squares for the sort of rural areas. But then when you get down to the watercourse information, you'd need to have very much smaller grid square sizes. And on such a grand scale, um, to get this accurately established in 2D um, could be a, a stretch. So the idea would be to use the 1D methodology for the watercourses and then apply the 2D when the water course is in flood, when the water is topping the bank on either side. And this is the methodology that we're incorporating within the Shipston case study. Again, with 2D, there are some great advantages, but also some disadvantages of surely working in this mode. And we don't have so many people that have been using the 2D um, in this country. It's growing and it's growing quite quickly, but there are few and far between experienced 2D modelers. And there aren't that many packages that are commercially available as well to carry out this type of work. So we're trying to get together with the best of both worlds and set up the water courses in 1D and then analyze the overland flooding in 2D. And it's this specifically for a rural application. The amount of detail that we put in here is purely down to the site conditions. So uh, there are no concerns if we have a road crossing with a culvert, this can be modeled. If we have a water course with a bridge, this can be modeled. We can have uh, ponding areas within the DTM. We can set up ponding areas. We can set up funds, woody debris dams, etc., all within the software itself to create this um, initially the base scenario. When we're looking at the 1D, 2D combination, um, this is really illustrating what we need to set up in the model. We set up the water course in 1D. We would establish, looking downstream, the left-hand bank and the right-hand bank. So to convey the flow and analyze the flow, the most accurate way really is within the 1D hydraulic section. The question arises, well, what happens when the river bank is in flood? Where is the water going to run across the DTM? And this is where we need to um, establish the connection between one and the other in the model and then analyze without double accounting for the flows within the model itself. And as I mentioned before, with this water course, we could set up a base scenario with a water course. Um, if someone was working with micro drainage and designing a new development that connected into a water course, we could import that drainage network uh, along with the subcatchment areas that are creating the flow within the new development to look at water levels in the river itself. So that's another option for working with the program. So looking on plan, what we would do is set up um, connections between the 1D and the 2D and have an interface line along the right-hand bank and along the left-hand bank. Typically, we would set up our grid squares, as I say, more dense in areas of uh, known flooding issues and larger grid squares for the large expanses of, of rural area. And that's important because if we were working just in 2D, you could use a very, very large grid square and basically miss the impact of the cross-sectional area of the watercourse. And that watercourse may simply be um, ditches along hedgerows and things like that, which could have quite major effects. Uh, on the runoff characteristics of the catchment. And then moving on, once we've run the analyses for those various return periods, and including for climate change, as Tom mentioned, we can then output information in a variety of formats. And this is really important in terms of sharing that information with the stakeholders. We're looking at um, times and durations of inundation. Uh, this would be specifically important for those crops. You know, how long are the crops underwater for? What's the velocity of the water? What's the depth of the water? How long would it be underwater for? How long until that um, water reaches its peak velocity or its peak depth? And uh, a variety of different outputs that we can extract directly from the program having run the analysis. So we can set up a base scenario. We can then set up a range of different mitigation measures. We can look at uh, identifying a range of ideas, implementing those ideas into the model and then running the analysis simultaneously and then comparing the results. This is just showing you um, another option to e extract information based on evacuation routes. So Tom mentioned the, the buns idea. And when the buns uh, are holding back the flow with the nine inch orifice or the nine inch pipe running through, those buns themselves become evacuation routes for the sheep to cross from one field across to the higher land maybe. So how much time would the farmer have uh, to ba basically move the sheep across the bund 
uh, and get to the higher land. We can set up an evacuation route line along the bund, or in this case, it's showing along a highway, and it's telling us how long until the water reaches a certain depth. So it provides us with uh, emergency plan information, which is very important. It's just showing you a, a background image of the highway and telling us that it will take 0.57 hours for the water level to reach 300 millimeters in the highway. So at what point does the road become impassable? It's after that period of time. So around about sort of 35, 36 minutes, in other words, of that event arriving. Um, it's not just graphical output. We can extract from XP tables a whatever information is contained within the program, basically. So you can set up the information that you require to um, output. And in this case, we've said, tell us um, how long until the water uh, is reaching 150 millimeters, 300 millimeters, and 500 millimeters. Um, how long does it take for that water to initially reach that depth? How long does that last for? So what's the duration of time that the water is at that depth uh, of 150 mil or 300 mil or 500 millimeters, for example. This can also be illustrated graphically and we can extract this information in GIS format. So that can come straight back into ARC if you want to identify properties or buildings would be uh, at risk for what period of time. So in this particular case, um, I'm saying Tell me um, how long this area will be under 300 millimeters of water. So the, the light blue is telling me it's around about a half an hour. Uh, when you get up to the yellow, it's around about an hour and a half. And when it's red, it's two hours um, of inundation at 300 millimeters depth. Helps you to understand uh, the situation in the catchment. What's the duration of the inundation? So how long will this area be under 300 millimeters of water? So the red is saying three hours. So this is the sort of channel section alongside the highway here. It'll be under 300 millimeters of water for something in the region of three hours. Uh, the blue is a third of an hour. So 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. We can also combine this to look at the maximum hazard uh, ratings. So comparing the velocity of that water with the depth of the water to extract as the uh, DEFRA hazard rating requirements. And looking at the pure maximum depth of water that's occurred during any of the events, we can extract this information. So in conclusion, it's just relatively straightforward to model the 1D, 2D combination. There is a little bit of work involved, um, rubbish in, rubbish out, I hear you all thinking, but with that information available, it's relatively straightforward with a user-friendly interface to generate this type of model. A word of warning on extremely large models, the runtimes will extend. So there are improvements constantly happening with all the software programs uh, modeling to improve those runtimes for you. Um, the 1D, 2D combination will give you the best optimum way of working with this type of model. Not only is it user-friendly in terms of the inputs, but the outputs are extremely helpful. We could run videos of this as well, by the way. But output and take back into GIS would be the ideal way forward. And we can run these various scenarios to assess the proposals and put money to this, as well as explaining to the landowner, explaining to the farmer how long his crops would be inundated for, etc. So we can prove those cost benefits with the modeling. And moving on to the cost the greatest complexity isn't so much the modeling, it's the actual funding mechanisms is a, a lot of the um, the reasons why these schemes won't go ahead. So any feedback, we will be running a short survey at the end of this, by the way. So any help with the, uh, the funding ideas uh, is one of the questions that Tom and I would be very interested to hear from you at the end of the presentation. So I hope that was of interest. Uh, I appreciate the questions that have come in. Before I go on to next month, there was one, Tom, that came in where this caught my eye, but there are others that we will answer and send the answers back to everybody at the end of the presentation. Did you find any landowners that were able themselves to carry out the work and, and were they competent to actually carry out that kind of work? Uh, it's an interesting question um, because actually most people assume that, that farmers are landowners and you know, all own tractors and 360 diggers and can do this sort of work. Um, in practice, that's not always the case. So, um, I would say most are across my particular study area, but there were times when we've had to consult with an external contractor 
Um, it's best to use someone local, someone that the landowner knows, um, that do the works and are proficient in this sort of groundwork. Right, great. Thank you. And thank Tom for showing us and uh, showing us the light at the end of the culvert. So uh, <laughs> thanks for that. So looking ahead to next month, folks, we have some training sessions coming up with XP Swim between the 6th and the 8th of December. I um, haven't checked with Marta the numbers yet, whether there are spaces available. I am assuming that there are. Just before that, we're running a, a week's training with micro drainage. It's really interesting for me because a lot of things that came out of Tom's study so far, the importance of local engagement, um, don't underestimate local knowledge, the multiple benefits that are kind of coming through from these schemes. There's a very much a, a comparison with what we're doing at a local level on new developments with SUDS. I can see with the catchment scale with natural flood management techniques is very interesting. The next webinar, um, talking of what we were looking at next will be on micro drainage on Wednesday, the 14th of December. So you'd be more than welcome to uh, engage with us and join us on that webinar. Uh, we'll send out an email so that you can register. Again, uh, Stuart and the team will send out an ecast to enable you to book for that. And, uh, Christian and the team, Christian Becker, our man in Germany will be attending the Abwasser uh, conference and exhibition over in Germany in January. So anyone listening in from Germany, uh, pop along and, and say hi to Christian and the team there. That would be great. Peter, we do have some questions which oh, came in. Sure. So I think Tom wants to answer some of them. Yeah, sure. We, we've got time for questions. I'm looking over my shoulder and uh, <laughs> I was a little bit anxious on the time, but that's great. If you want to go with the questions, Lee. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll do this really quickly. So. Yeah, yeah if just basically uh, we have a question from Simon. When decoupling from flood peaks, have you been looking at joining possibility and different storm durations for the smaller subcatchments to prove the intervention uh, that makes the peak worse in all situations? Yeah, sure. That's a, that's a really valid point. So obviously on this sort of scale, um, I, I hopefully I sort of made it clear earlier that you don't want to create a, almost dam burst effects where you are synchronizing flood flows. So as part of the um, sort of scenario planning um, and understanding the sort of temporal relation between all these different subcatchments and flood propagation, uh, the SWIM model will include um, separate hydrographs, as it were, for each of the delineations that can then ultimately augment the, the hydrograph to indicate, you know, basically are we really attenuating the overall flow? So, uh, yes, really, really valid, really valid question. Uh, there is another question from Can. Is there any initial findings of reduced flood risk to the downstream properties? God, wow. Isn't that the question? Yes. <laughs> um, uh, yes, well, um, principally on volumes, um, on a local scale, for example, the Can cumulatively, that volume has been shown to, you know, to slow the flow um, and lower the, the volumes that are entering Chipping Camden, which is the downstream settlement. Um, but on the meso scale, um, no. And for the same answer, really, as the um, as the previous question, that I really need to sort of hone in with my modelling the influence of desynchronisation, that lowering uh, risk, and obviously um, saving properties, as it were. So I hope that I hope that's partly answered. Answered it. Uh, another question from Ray: How much calibration actually is involved? Uh, how much calibration have you done? Or you can't yet answer how much. I hope to do some informal calibration with the sort of networks of, of farmers um, using existing images that they have across the catchment um, of particular events that then I can reference to. Um, as well as, um, interestingly, there are 4D sources for calibration as well. So um, some of the farms are private organisations that advertise on social media. And over particular events, they have taken images of the event that I can then refer to. On a sort of numerical scale as well, um, I have got some sort of triangulated rainfall, rainfall data that I hope to do some sort of regression analysis to um, to identify basically the relation to the discharge data, peak cover thresholds, and an ultimate sort of hydrograph that can indicate how accurate the data was. Yeah, it's worth mentioning that there is the one gauge in the river, but it is yes. the Dan there's one major downstream gauge um, at Mitford Bridge just uh, south of uh, Shipston on Stour, but it is in, in the Stour, isn't it? Just like downstream of the confluence of the three rivers, so we yes. don't have anything up each of the catchments. Basically. Yes, yes. So obviously, calibrating each of the delineation contributions is, you know, there's there's less confluence because we're past that confluence as well. Very interesting though, with the local knowledge. I, I, my past experience was the same when I, I worked um, for local authorities, and we were engaged with um, you know, farmers and, and also local residents. And 
believe me, when there's been a flooding event, they know exactly where the water level reached. It's, it, and I do value that very personally. I value that very, I can't put a number on it, um, but I value that local knowledge probably above you know, most things, to be honest with you, because it can help to validate your models. We are out of time. I believe all other questions we will send the replies individually to people's emails. Okay. Well, thank thank you, Ludi. Thank you, Tom. Um, I really appreciate it. This is the start of a process, folks, and uh, I look forward to inviting Tom back on, on numerous occasions and keeping up to date with how progress is going and uh, hear more successes in the future. So thank you all for your participation. Thank you for your questions. Um, have a great month. Look forward to engaging with you in December. And thank you once again, Tom. That was yes. really great. Thank and you very much. Appreciated. Take care, everyone. Bye for now. Bye-bye.